It's now the middle of April and Lesser Celandine is in full flower in woods and hedges, a sure sign that summer is just around the corner. And it also grows sometimes in wetter places, so from a distance you might be inclined to think that these are large Lesser Celandine flowers, but if you put them side by side you can see they're quite different, quite different. They have a lot of characteristics in common because they both belong to the same buttercup family, but the flowers in Marsh Marigold are much larger, wonderful burnished gold colour. Um, and you might think these are the petals, but in fact these are sepals. You can see there are no floral organs behind them, showing you that these are in fact sepals. And in bud uh, they're still green like more familiar uh, fl flowers would have. So there you have the golden sepals and inside that there's a palisade of stamens and at the centre of the flower a pistil of between five and ten carpels which after fertilisation will become follicles. A follicle is a dehiscent fruit that splits along one side to release the seeds. And even though to our eyes the flowers are this wonderful golden colour, the eyes of bees see them differently. To the eyes of a bee the colour is what we call bee purple, a colour that we can not only not see because it's in a band of the electromagnetic spectrum that is invisible to us, but we can't even imagine what it looks like. The stamens and carpels mature together, but cross-pollination is favoured by the way the anthers mature centripetally from the outside in, and they open to expose their pollen on the outside, away from the cluster of carpels at the centre. What attracts pollinating insects to the very conspicuous flowers is mainly the nectar, which is secreted abundantly in two shallow depressions, one on either side of the ovary and is accessible to even the most short-tongued of insects, many kinds of flies, beetles and caddisflies, of which there are lots around at night, so it's no accident that the flowers remain open at night. But one of the most interesting of these visitors is a tiny moth that feeds on the pollen and whose name reflects this both in Latin and English, the marsh marigold moth, Micropteryx caltella. Another interesting thing about this beautiful insect is that it belongs to a more primitive family than most other moths, one that still has chewing mouth parts, quite different from the highly specialised sucking mouth parts of more familiar moths. When other moths visit flowers, they can only sip nectar, but the marsh marigold moth can chew pollen grains. Swampy places like ditches and drains or the margins of ponds are the usual habitat of marsh marigold, but it can grow in deeper water as well. But in deeper water its leaves are quite different. They have long thin stalks and tiny leaves. The Mary of the common English name is of course the Virgin Mary after whom many wild flowers were named in a more Christian long ago time but it has dozens, probably hundreds, of local English names. Another common English name is King Cup. Its name in Irish is Lusbui Baltina, the yellow flower of May. Marsh Marigold is a good example of the medieval doctrine of signatures, which held that God, who had made all things in the beginning for our use, would have left clues in the various plants as to what they were meant to be used for. And since the medieval imagination thought that the leaf of marsh marigold resembled the hoof of a horse, it was thought to be an infallible cure for the bite of a horse. But it had a wide range of other medicinal and culinary uses, even though the plant is poisonous, but the poison is neutralised when it's heated or boiled. So for example, uh, the, the buds were pickled like capers and in parts of North America it was an important pot herb. And among its many other more unusual uses there's one you might like to try. It was thought that if you wore marsh marigold around your neck 
Not only would it ward off the unkind remarks of others, but it would prevent you from making such remarks yourself.